Hey everybody, hope you're all doing well. My name is Steven and this is the Storytime channel. Today we have some malicious compliance stories and our first story of the day is by M. Hendricks. You think you found a shortcut? Think again. Going through the stories here, I realized I have a malicious compliance of my own. I used to work at a software development company for medical professions. Each program had its own help desk and then there was my team that did the support for the hardware the software ran on. I had the luck that the manager I had at the time would let me do my thing because I am all customer satisfaction and solving problems properly, so he never bothered me too much with these stupid statistics that he got shoved down his throat by upper management. Because of that, my manager also knew that any kind of half bud customer service on my part was definitely warranted. There is a story where he and the rest of my team were signaling me to hang up the phone with an unreasonable customer I kept trying to help. The phone system was set up in a way that most of the customers would be recognized by the system and be routed to the correct help desk. The only choice menu most of them got was if they needed their software help desk or the hardware help desk. Only big flaw in this phone system was that there was no way to put people into the queue of transfer to another queue. The only way to transfer was to check with a colleague if they were willing to keep their line free so I could transfer them. I want to make it crystal clear that I am all about helping and customer service, but I had learned in the past being the person who was the senior member of the team and did the job longer than my direct colleagues and my manager that unfortunately a lot of customers needed to be educated or our little team would have no time for real work because of having to play telephone operator for the other help desks. That's what you get when your team has a pickup rate of 95%. A lot of our customers, especially the general practitioners, had a habit of trying to exploit the system. So on the days the fine people of software had a bit of waiting time, as a result of a lot of people calling, they tried to find a shortcut by choosing hardware and asking us to transfer to software. This was not a real option because the system would instantly connect a person from the software queue to the first available person. As a result of this, I only transferred customers that made a genuine mistake by choosing hardware. Some issues could look hardware related at first glance, but are software issues. No matter what, you choose hardware when you know you need software, you have to call back and choose software. On paper, I had no problem with transferring, but most in reality, you quickly learn that when you give them an inch, they take it all. Flashbacks to the nightmare month where they changed a choose option in the menu from software to hardware and as a result we did nothing but play, you did not listen to the menu, if I transfer you now to software, you are going to keep choosing the wrong option so you have to call back and do it the proper way. So one afternoon, I get a call from an annoyed general practitioner who gave up after a few minutes in the software queue and tried her luck via hardware. Good afternoon, technical services company name, me speaking. I have a software issue and God do not wish to wait in their queue any longer. I want you to connect me to software. No hello of who she is, immediately the demand in the rudest tone I ever witnessed. I am afraid that the quickest way is calling back and waiting the software queue. You will be connected to the first available person. No, I am going to wait and you are going to connect me to the first person available. Me trying to explain that there is no available person available soon because the system would be sure that they would be available for 0.1 second before routing the next caller from the queue to their phone. That could be a while because… I don't care, I am going to wait, do not hang up and connect me to the first available person. I fear that the wait might be longer than calling back. No, I am not calling back. I waited 30 minutes. I have better things to do. You are going to connect me to the next available person. Me knowing the longest wait in their queue today was like 5 minutes. Really, the quickest way? No, no, no. Do not hang up. I am going to wait till you connect me to the first person that is available. I would not adv- you listen now, I pay your salary. Not true, now hardware contract so she only paid for software support. You are going to do what I say and connect me to the next available person. Me giving up at this point and thinking that it might be a contender for my longest time waiting list. Okay, I will connect you to the first person of software I see available in the system. You better. So I did what I do best with these kinds of people. 
I made like Clark Gable and I frankly did not give a damn. I muted my headset and started the waiting game to see how long they would wait. After all, there were constantly 10 people waiting in their queue. Small issue after an update, easy fix so that explains the average wait time of only 5 minutes. After a relaxing session of internet that lasted 20 minutes, with an impatient rude lady on my line getting more and more annoyed, I was disturbed by the shout of somebody else on the line that was instructed a couple of minutes before to call software and got through. General practitioner let out a loud, FINALLY, before hanging up on me. After checking the hardware queue and seeing no waiting customers, I decided a trip to the coffee machine was in order so I could share my new record for longest time waiting with my amused colleagues. This story kind of has me wondering, of all the times you guys have called into these kinds of phone lines and had to wait, how long was the longest time you sat there on hold waiting for somebody to connect to you? For me, sometime in the early 2010s, I was calling some kind of phone service and it was probably half an hour for me, so all things considered not terrible, but let me know your times in the comments down below. Our next story is by Chicken and Raffles. I humiliated my verbally abusive third grade teacher because he asked us to do impressions of him. This is a long one, but I have to set the stage. My third grade teacher, Mr. White, looked a lot like Stanley Tucci. Unlike the acting range that Stanley Tucci's characters have, Mr. White had two modes, calm and insane. He was the first teacher I ever had that would scream at us. And I don't mean raise his voice and tell us to be quiet, I mean red-faced crazy guy on the street corner at midnight screaming in your face. Being the naive 8-9 to nine year olds that we were, we just fearfully went with it. It was always over benign stuff too. He loved to single kids out for minor things that irritated him. You talk while he's talking, he would get right in your face and tell you how you've ruined the lesson, then have the class sit in silence for 20 minutes. One time, two kids were having a ruler fight, holding their rulers like swords and pretending to battle in slow motion. Mr. White ran up, snatched both rulers from their hands, snapped them in half across his knee, and dropped the pieces to the floor. Many children shed tears in his class. My biggest mistake was letting a pencil accidentally roll off my desk and hit the floor during a lesson. I vaguely remember him saying beforehand that we played too much with our pencils. Well, that set him off and I was sent outside. Not to the principals, just outside the door to stand in the rain to think about it. Oh, and he threw a whiteboard eraser at my friend Jared, which we laugh about to this day, but I see a bit of repressed trauma in Jared's poor little eyes when we do. Eventually, parents begin to catch wind and wonder why their kids were coming home crying, so the principal was contacted. Multiple times, and by the end of the year, Mr. White's outbursts weren't as frequent, but he was still super volatile. So the last day of class comes and Mr. White says he has a fun treat for us. He's going to sit in a chair at the front of the class, and we get to line up, face the class, and do impressions of him. He says we can make fun of him and his funny little quirks. He wasn't a demon 24-7. He did little things like say, I'm not me until I've had my coffee, and step outside to pass gas because he didn't want to poison us. And he always had to wipe his glasses off but couldn't find his lens cleaners. Ha ha, how quirky. And when the other kids got up and started pretending to be Mr. White, that's mostly the kind of stuff they touched on in their fun little ways. He smiled, the kids laughed, how cute. Well, I was about 10th in line and I had a different idea. It was my turn and when I got up to the front, I turned to one of the more abused kids in the class and screamed at the top of my lungs, Jared, if you don't put that crap down, you will be out of my class forever. And Amelia, you need to shut your freaking mouth now, I'm sick of you. And just absolutely went off, pretending to throw crap, etc. The class loved it. Mr. White immediately turned into Mr. Red, but he couldn't say a dang thing about it because he was already on thin ice. Plus, we were moving on from his class anyway, and he knew it was all true. I think the most surprising thing to him was that I was one of the quietest kids that whole year. All he could do was fake a smile, but god darn, he actually looked pissed. 
The best part is, my imitation got such a kick that a few other kids that went after me did the same thing, just imitating his insane rants and mannerisms. And he had to sit there and take it because it's literally what he asked us to do, act like him. In the final goodbye to his students, he didn't say a word to me and I was too scared to even approach him. I hope he isn't teaching anymore because he is a true terrifying presence to children. Maybe throwing his fun little exercise back in his face made him get a Thorazine prescription or seek therapy. God knows he needed it. I'm not sure if I needed this story today, I'ma be quite honest. Reading through this made me just have like flashbacks of various experiences all through elementary and middle school and the younger just years of my school experience. I had a fake ruler fight just joking around with a friend in a library once and they banned me from getting books, and I had to explain to my teacher why I didn't have any books from the library that day. I had one teacher in middle school that wasn't afraid of screaming and yelling at kids. This story seemed to touch on a lot of memories for me. This next story is by Storymaker1235, how my 8th grade math teacher fought corporate greed and negligence with the power of gummy bears. I know that's a wild ride of a title, but I promise it's all true, so buckle up. When I was in 8th grade, I was in the first year of an experimental technology school. I had a class of about 180 8th graders, 12 to 14 year olds, and about 10 teachers. So everybody shared the same math teacher. For our first semester, we used a software called Gage. It was alright for most classes, but it was absolutely atrocious when it came to math. Nothing worked with math. We were supposed to use the lessons they had, but it just didn't work. Math symbols didn't show up right and some questions even had the wrong answer marked. My math teacher wasn't allowed to just move to paper and the company insisted that the problem was that our math teacher was older and just didn't understand technology. They said that if she had a genuine issue, to email them. One day, I get to class and there are seven email addresses written on the board. She told us that we were going to go through our math lesson today and take screenshots of every mistake we found and email them to the company's executives. One screenshot equals one email. Ten emails equals a packet of gummy bears. We had a blast trying to send as many emails as we could. One kid got ten packets of gummy bears by the end of the hour of class. By lunch, the principal called my teacher aside and asked for her to stop. She said, heck no, my afternoon classes haven't had fun yet. Long story short, our school district got all of its money back from using the software and the company no longer exists. Or they changed their brand out of shame. I don't know, I just can't find them anymore. If you want to incentivize a bunch of 12 to 14 year olds, promising some gummy candies is a pretty surefire way to get them motivated. And taking a screenshot and sending an email of it to some email isn't that hard of work, so I'm sure there were plenty of emails sent. Our next story is by Tian Hitchin. Give me a slow laptop and blame me for taking too long to do things? Fine. I know I'll get a better one from you soon enough. Inspired by some of the recent posts about technology woes in school settings, I have one from my middle school years. I was part of a technology pilot program which wanted every kid to have a laptop to accompany their schooling. My school, being in an affluent neighborhood, assumed that every student would bring their own half-decent laptop to class and said they would provide laptops to those who could not afford them. They were right to think that this would be a fairly small amount, at least initially. My parents were unable to buy a laptop after some troubling financial situations arose, so we asked the school to provide one. Oh boy, what a hunk of junk that was. The total polar opposite of the top-end fancy laptops available at the time. It had the computing power of synthetic peanut butter and had the resolution of a knockoff kaleidoscope. I had a lot of fun with that machine. Anyway, it was very, very slow in comparison to what my peers were using. The school, in their infinite wisdom, thought that the, not exaggerating here, I tested it, 10 times slower response time would not be an issue. I informed them that I would be at a significant disadvantage to the other students, but they brushed it off. I was near the top of my class, but not by so far I could just take a handicap like that. 
But alas, all that protest was in vain. Well, if they wanted it that way, that's what they were going to get. The first computer-based test, 30 minutes. My classmates finished after 15 to 20 minutes. Guess who was stuck there nearly an hour after my classmates? Yeah, that was fun. Somehow this was my fault though. The teachers proctoring it knew it wasn't. The IT department knew it wasn't. Yet it was still my fault for being slow. I got reprimanded for that. So come the next test, I asked to take the test on paper instead. The leader of the pilot program went on this long lecture about how the experience is different. Freak off, it's a math test, how much more different can it be? After another excruciatingly long testing period, the teacher slid me a copy of the paper test and said he'd overlook it for now, my favorite teacher by the way, and submit the test through his own accounting citing technology troubles. Lo and behold, it's literally no different from the test I was just taking. A few days after taking that second test, parents started complaining. Can you guess why? A student who gets good grades is also allowed two times extra time? Yeah, that totally went over well. My grades actually didn't really improve much from that, but the point still stands. Those parents were so infuriated by the disparity in technology available. No doubt wanting their kids not to have anything except at least equal equipment to the others, and that I was getting some sort of advantage somehow. That they pushed for the school to enforce a minimum standard of laptop. Myself? I can't complain too much. I got a free, good laptop. I'm sure there was whatever superintendent at the top pocketing a whole bunch of money, while the kids at the very bottom that couldn't afford the laptop had to deal with inadequate equipment. It's funny how when all the parents start coming together and demand a minimum standard of a good working laptop, all of a sudden, poof, they can just acquire them. It really tells you all you need to know. And our final story of the day is by Concern Secure. Don't want to join the queue? That's fine. Enjoy the wait. This happened a while back, but I only remembered it recently. I work security in a phone shop in a major city. Pretty much the flagship shop's overflow shop, so we aren't busy unless the main shop is packed. That day, both shops were insanely full. There was a large queue in the shop and it wasn't getting smaller. This man walks in and starts walking past the queue. It's not like the queue is hard to miss, so I approach him. Excuse me, sir, there's a queue there you need to join. No, I'm fine. Sir, there's a queue. You have to join it if you want to talk to staff. He has now walked past the queue, which is about 10 people big, and is standing opposite the desk by the wall. Sir, if you want to talk to staff, you have to join the queue. I heard you the first time. Okay, but you will not be served before the people in the queue. Whatever, you go back to the door and leave me alone. I look at the manager and he gives me a nod to let me know he's got this. The man tried a couple of times to be served, but he was first told to join the queue by staff. Then he was just ignored as they served the people in the queue. The queue does not get smaller. In fact, it grows a couple of times. I watch him get annoyed and start huffing and cursing under his breath. He has to wait for almost an hour and a half because he wouldn't join the queue. When the shop is finally empty, the staff take their sweet time with the paperwork. The manager said they could and he would sort him out. The manager approaches him and he's not happy. He complains about the wait and the manager just looks at him with absolute incredulity. He says something racist to the manager and the manager kicks him out. One, how stupid can you be? And two, I'm surprised that kind of a person didn't get outright belligerent and try chucking stuff around or roughing whoever up. Just kind of get that vibe from this guy. All things considered, he probably let the staff off easy with that. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So if you have a favorite story of the day, let me know which story and why in the comments down below. But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like. And if you haven't, subscribe and turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. No matter what you do, whether it's just viewing the video, liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, I appreciate the heck out of it. Every little thing that you do helps the channel grow that much more and I can't thank you enough for it.
So until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll be right here next time on the Storytime channel.